Alright, welcome back to Weeplay Games. I'm Walker, and here we are about to discuss the open beta for The Watcher for Age of Wonders 4. So for those of you who've never played with any of the open betas for Paradox Interactive games, it's not too hard. Just go down to Steam, go over to Age of Wonders 4, right click on it, go to Properties, go to Betas, and then go to Open Beta. And then you're just going to get a little update, it'll push out the patch to you, and then you can play on the open beta and experience Watcher for yourself. But I think that this is a really, really radical redesign on a couple of critical things, and so I'm just going to highlight those critical things as we go through it. We'll also talk a little bit about the small changes along the way, but I don't want this to be a four hour video and Jesus Christ, there is a lot of stuff being adjusted here. So if you want, you can go through it, just read absolutely everything, but I'm going to try to make this just a, a quick and easy recap of the changes in the Watcher patch. So I think the, the first and biggest change is the one that Paradox and Triumph have highlighted here. Research scaling means that now the meta is basically broken. So for those of you who've been playing only single player and trying to cheese the AI with extremely high damage archers, you still kind of can do that, but that strategy relied on your ability to research lots and lots of low level tomes very quickly, and you cannot do that anymore. So the way research works now in the Watcher update is that for every tome that you unlock, you get a progressive passive at addition to the cost of every skill or spell that you research. As you research more and more tomes, this passive cost will increase all the way up to your 12th tome 5,000 knowledge, which is just crazy. And so what this means is that you really do need to have in mind a tier 5 tome as your target rather than just like a billion low level tomes because otherwise you're just going to get left behind by the people who are actually pushing towards a tier 5 tome. The reason this is critical, of course, is that if you're playing in multiplayer or if they make the battle AI, like, actually function, then they're going to take advantage of your tier 1 units and just thrash them with status resistance problems because tier 1 archers fold to, to stuns pretty badly and Tectonic Shatter is still the strongest spell in the game by a, a pretty big margin. And so if you just don't do anything and you let your opponent build all the way up to, to Tectonic Shatter and they can just bury you in value, you can do as much damage as you want to with your Glass Cannon Archers, they'll never move. And so now you really do need to have a much cleaner idea of how you're going to do research, not only because you can't rely on a whole bunch of low-level tomes to push you through to the end game, but also because wasting research is a lot more painful. So normally when I'm playing, at least in the Wyvern update, I don't worry too much about researching skills that I'm never going to use because they're still going to make progress through tomes. That's not the case when you're playing on Watcher. When you're playing on Watcher, you're definitely going to be clicking the reset skills multiple times, at least I was, because you really can't afford to be researching things that you don't want because that'll make you take progress towards your next tome. And therefore, not only are you wasting the knowledge on the skill that you're researching, but it's also taking you up to a higher passive cost for knowledge for all of those spells that you research that you don't need. And so you need to be really, really careful when it comes to your research in Age of Wonders 4 with a Watcher update. I think it's a little hostile to new players in a way that I don't necessarily like, but once people get used to the, the new meta and the way things scale, I think it'll play pretty well. It played pretty well for me, at least. There's also a really big change here in regards to the magic victory. So magic victory, they've dropped the seeds and the roots and all that stuff, which is largely a good thing because it means that researching things is even slower. So now you don't get that minus 20% knowledge bonus on whatever kind of research you're doing, but it also means a lot less affinity running around for you. So you can't just pick up like one tier three tome, build the associated seed and then go on from there. You do actually have to build build your faction to adapt a specific affinity if you want to go towards those tier 5 tomes. The Magic Victory re rework doesn't just drop the seeds and the roots, it also adds this Bind Gold Ancient Wonder. So this is a spell that you're going to have to research when you get your tier 3 tome. It allows you to cast a big powerful spell on a golden ancient wonder, then it adds 30 knowledge per turn, but more critically, it's necessary to do that in order to actually cast your magic victory spell. The magic victory spell unlocks with your tier 5 tome, and costs like a gazillion knowledge, so set yourself up for that. And then of course once you've cast it, you do still have to do that long term defense. 
So what this means in the meta is that magic victory is just a lot harder to accomplish. You can still do it while largely ignoring your enemies, but you have to conquer a gold ancient wonder and you have to attach it to one of your cities. And if you're playing on a really big map, sometimes you have to capture a second or sometimes even a third. And so gold ancient wonders, they're not the easiest things to capture to begin with. If you're playing on brutal with really high world threat, they can be very difficult and you're gonna need multiple of them, not to mention enormous amounts of knowledge in order to actually use them for a victory condition. So this means that magic victory, is it's still there, but I think it's a lot harder to accomplish and very difficult to spam with like just underground, ignore what's going on outside, build my economy and go kind of strategies. They've also done a pretty meaningful change in regards to the summoning and casting. So now you can only cast one spell on the strategic map per turn. You can go up to a second if you have the channeling chamber, but that is a huge change. It means that you can't just cast tons and tons of damage spells, even if you pre-queue a lot of them. You can't just unleash tons of spells all at once. You do have to have very, very specific control over what spells you're casting and when. And so I think this is largely a good change in my book. It also means that the Wizard King is like slightly nerfed because the Wizard King used to have just infinite access to casting points and then could cast whatever they wanted to. You can still do that in combat, but you can't do that on the strategic layer, and so you can't just summon units and create an army out of nowhere. On that note, not only can you not cast thousands of summons, but the summons themselves are pretty heavily nerfed. So summons now can only be summoned next to your city and next to your ruler. This means that you can't just use summons as infinite scouts. You need to place them pretty well and utilize your existing army infrastructure to actually support the summons. There's also been some more map improvements. They've been trying to buff the underground over and over again, and I think they've finally gotten there. So both of the games that I played on the Watcher patch, I played with uh, the underground as my mind trait, and it played really, really well, because I think excavating is a great mechanic. So excavating allows you to move a unit up to like the dirt that's in the underground and just click a shovel, clear the space. You might get some production, you might some get some gold, you might get some artifacts. It's basically the materium pool, but it doesn't unleash stacks of monsters anymore. So one of the problems in the Wyvern update, if you're playing in the underground, is that you can just randomly spawn marauders, which can be a good thing if you want experience points, but it can be a bad thing if you spawn like a bone wyvern and have absolutely no troops because you're playing on brutal it can be very terrifying to play in the underground in, in wyvern but in watcher underground is really really good it does mean sacrificing your mind trait which could give you a lot of extra military oomph in the late game because you know elusive or adaptable gives you lots of extra flexibility and strength once you get to the end game. But in the early game, I think Underground is the best economic choice that you get access to because it gives you tons of Imperium, because it gives you the excavation Imperium pick for free. And of course, the Underground just plays well. Like, you get a whole big space for yourself. And critically, cities can now annex provinces on the opposite layer through underground passages. So this means that if you build a huge city under the earth and you find an underground passage, you can actually start to spill onto the, the upper layer, and that allows you to create a lot more adjacencies in the event that you want to go materium focus and you want to have adjacent cities. But even if you don't, being able to expand your cities up to the surface layer or down into the underground. Very, very good on either side. It plays really well. There's some huge rework in regards to the AI. I think they're they're still making some progress here. I think that they did a pretty good job with updating the AI, especially in regards to their, their desire to take over Ancient Wonders near them. But I will say that even though they've updated the AI to be better at clearing Ancient Wonders, the AI does still struggle a little bit in terms of manual battles. So if you want free wins, you can still manual battle the AI and, and crush their troops. But they've gotten better and better on the strategic layer, and so I'm hoping that means that they're going to get better and better on the battle layer as well. There's been a little change in regards to the XP gain, so if you're used to just taking a really high level dragon and clearing one after another after another, uh, you can still do that, 
but you're wasting tons of experience points. There's also been some small rebalances in regards to the way cultures play out. I think one of the biggest things here is just that knights get giant slayer. This doesn't make knights like a real counter to gold golems. Gold golems are still like the biggest problem in the late game because they counter basically everything and are so unbelievably durable, especially once they become undying, that even the, the archer spam doesn't really help. But giving knights access to giant slayer, it means that there's a little bit more counterplay, but I, I do think the biggest issue is just how strong Materium is, and it doesn't look like Watcher has done a lot to, to adjust that. For that matter, if you're playing Materium and you're playing with Industrious, now there's a nice little buff here. Uh, Bastions are a little stronger, as well as Steel Shapers. High is also nerfed just a little bit. Awakened now deals three spirit damage instead of four, but the big bonus for High, which is the extra range on their archers, remains. Diplomacy is also a little different, because now releasing cities doesn't give you Imperium, it actually costs you Imperium. So this means just like the, the normal spam of get as many small cities as possible and just release them as quickly as you can no longer helps you economically. You do need to be careful about which things you turn into cities and what things you don't. You don't want to make wasted cities anymore, because they are expensive. 75 Imperium for the second city to release, 150 for the third, 225 for the fourth. So at a certain point, if you are trying to make a lot of, of vassals, you may have to just conquer some of them. Roads are also faster outside of enemy domain, which is a very big deal when you're trying to move things around. Underground adaptation has plus one annex range on cities in the underground. Chosen destroyers can actually get a higher hero cap, which is very, very important because heroes have been redone in regards to the way they cost you more if you go over your hero cap. So now now, heroes, instead of being a flat 30, they cost 15% of your player's gross gold income. Not net, gross. So this means that if you end up with, you know, five heroes over your hero cap, you're going to be bas basically making nothing. But it also means that picking up an extra hero in the early game is a lot less painful. The 30 extra gold was something that if you're playing on multiplayer, you just kind of eat it. You take a second hero as quickly as possible and then make progress from there. But you're going to actually have a stronger economy in the early game uh, doing it now on the, the Watcher patch because 15% of your gross gold income means a lot when you're got like six or seven cities or whatever, but means very little when your your civilization is very small. They've also implemented a limbo system, which was one of the things that I suggested with the how to fix dragon horde. I think that because the limbo is only one turn instead of two, it's probably fine. It's a, still a little annoying in regards to the way that equipping items works on heroes, especially the, the miscellaneous slots, because it always defaults back to the top slot and then it, it encourages you to drop items. This means now whenever you unequip an item, rather than it going straight back to your your pool, it enters limbo for one turn. So this means that now you can't do the same sort of dragon horde abuse mechanics that we talked about in that other video, and you do need to be a little more careful in regards to how you develop your economy. And affinity adept hero background also only grants plus one empire affinity instead of three is a huge deal, especially for multiplayer, because plus three empire affinity is an outrageous amount of imperium based stuff that you get access to, uh, whereas just plus one means that, you know, it's it's like a f four level difference on your ruler, basically, whereas a plus three is a 12 level difference. Very difficult to catch up if your opponent gets a, an affinity adept in uh, Wyvern. There's also been some uh, adjustments in regards to hero skills, especially on the Dragon Lords. The auras work pretty differently. Auras no longer affect the Dragon Lord themselves, which means that you can't just create like a, a nature dragon that survives everything forever because it has infinite regeneration. You do have mortal root dragon rulers now when they get up to level 20, which is pretty nice. And importantly, they've also made Comet Breath a full action. This means that I'm not even sure what the best Dragon Breath is anymore. Anymore. It used to be pretty clearly Comet Breath, because that was just an outrageous amount of damage, especially at range, and it would had a huge area of effect because of the way hexes actually work. But now, because Comet Breath is a full action and the other two are only one action, the other breaths might be stronger. We'll have to just play with it and see what it 
how it feels, but critically Weaver also no longer works on summon abilities and over channel. So this means that Weaver is a lot weaker, but it also means that overall Wizard Kings are a lot weaker. Now Wizard Kings are still very, very terrifying, but between the nerf to over channel and the nerf to the way research works generally, and the way casting works generally, Wizard Kings might be pulling back a little bit. We'll have to play it out, see how it feels. Spawnkin now only gives 10% evasion to heroes instead of extra damage. I think this makes sense. Extra damage on the heroes didn't really make sense thematically, but evasion, because they're smaller, yeah, I could see that. They've also dropped Resurgence from Rapid Evolution, which means that the Tome of Evolution is meaningfully weaker. It's still good, but between the Rapid Evolution being nerfed and Draconic Vitality being nerfed, now it caps at level 5 when giving a bonus to heroes, it means that Tome of Evolution is, is no longer like an, a forced pick. There are a couple of tomes that you kind of have to build into your, your build if you're being serious. I think one of them remains the Tome of Amplification just because of how good it is, but Tome of Evolution was basically in the same boat because of how good Rapid Evolution is in the uh, the Wyvern update, as well as Draconic Fatality, but those two getting nerfed means that now you have a little more flexibility in terms of your, your tome development. They've also reduced the optimal range for ranged units, which is going to be pretty meaningful. They finally fixed the uh, Nature Wild Expansion perk, which used to be a problem because you could just uh, trade trade things back and forth between two cities and just get infinite units that way, but now it's been fixed. But I think overall the way that this Watcher update has developed looks really good. The, like I said, there are still kind of two big problems in Age of Wonders 4, one of which is Tectonic Shatter and the other is Gold Golems, but I think that Paradox Interactive and, and Triumph have done a very good job of trying to address at least the things that are popular or potentially game-breaking in the, the Watcher update. So if you haven't played with it, I would give it a try. It's a lot of fun. All right, that's Walker. Take care.